uh, it's really so much of success in the business world is trust. And so to me, improv sometimes can be a, a speed track to realizing we're all human and can trust each other quit more quickly. But if you don't trust each other, you can't do things like that. And so it often can surface where there is lack of trust and lack of ability to be vulnerable, which we all need to be. Welcome to the Product Agility Podcast, the missing link between agile and product. The purpose of this podcast is to share practical tips, strategies, and stories from world-class thought leaders and practitioners. Why, I hear you ask? Well, I want to increase your knowledge and your motivation to experiment so that together we can create ever more successful products. My name is Ben Maynard, and I'm your host. What has driven me for the last decade to bridge the gap between agility and product is a deep-rooted belief that people and products evolving together can achieve mutual excellence. Sometimes in this world you meet people and you think, do you know what, you are someone that I really want to spend lots of time with. And this guest is one of those people for me. So first of all, I'm super, super happy to say I'm actually going to get to meet this person in person in Lisbon at the Productized Conference. Big big whoops from me. Suppose you're thinking, well, who is this wonderful person that Ben's talking about? Well, her name is Tammy Reese, and Tammy is wonderful. She is a product leadership coach. She is an experienced product professional. The work that she's been doing on helping product leaders to find their journey using product management techniques is kind of so obviously brilliant. I wonder why everyone isn't doing it already. So we'll tiptoe around that topic. We're going to look deep into what a platform is and what platform success means we're even going to talk about the dreaded thing of user stories and how we believe they should be composed our acceptance criteria can be created and maybe even check out an alternative format for you to try so without any further ado recommend this episode to a friend our numbers are going up which is lovely to see and let's just crack on with it shall we ladies and gentlemen i give you tammy reese product leadership coach one yeah, thanks, Tammy. That was a great conversation. Oh, that was the best. That was the best podcast episode I've ever recorded, and it was the best tribute to any podcast yeah. that I've ever been recorded. So, that kind of starting with the end in mind is not a way you should start a podcast, is it? Really, start by saying thank you everyone for listening. That's a that fantastic was a way to talk about product. Yeah, well, there we go. We're wondering where to start. Uh, just in case anybody's wondering. You haven't come in at the end of the podcast. This is the beginning. Uh, but it would appear that uh, Tammy end. and I have decided, yeah, to start at the end. Um, I'm joined by Tammy. Now, is it fair that it is okay to reference you as a Tammy from Miami? Oh, 100%. I have been Tammy from Miami since, 20, since 1999. So we're going to party like it's 1999 nice. and call me Tammy from Miami, and we're okay with that. Result. Because you did say in the talk that I watched that there is, you will curse people with telling people that you are Tammy from Miami. It's very hard to forget. Yes. Well, very I'm never going to. Forget. So, Tammy, uh, I, your reputation precedes you. You are very well known and uh, also a very engaging speaker. Thank you. I must say. I appreciate so I've been, the I've been very, I've been, I've been, I've been very excited, and perhaps a little bit. What's the word I'm looking for? Maybe nervous about getting you on, because <laughs> because you're so good, right? So it's because I I'm bite. not gonna. Sorry. It's because I bite. Luckily, we're on a podcast, so you're very far distance from me, and I can't bite you too hard. That's good. That's a relief. I've, I've spent the last two days getting bitten. Um, I actually, I, I actually got bitten at the weekend. I actually, got bitten by ticks. Oh, they have a little like blood sucking things. Two of them Lyme I had in one day. Watch out for Lyme disease, please. Yeah, I'm all right. It's fine. It's fine. The the, 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 the swelling's gone down. The bleeding stopped a day or two after. There was no bleeding, but then they're horrible little things. You know, I mean, what's worse than I don't like spiders. What's worse than things that look like spiders, uh, things that look like spiders, and suck your blood? Yep. Not they fun. Are cruel. Not fun at all. 
I live in Miami as a brother, where we have mosquitoes that suck your blood. And that's also not fun. Do you know that when people are allergic to mosquito bites, they're actually allergic to the saliva of the mosquito? Oh. I didn't even know that mosquitoes had saliva. There you go. Do you think mosquitoes spit then? Oh yeah, for sure. They're very big spitters while they're talking at a bar. <laughs> and when they get recorded for podcasts, so, they do lots of spit takes. That's the thing you're not going to get from me as much spit when it's remote. If you're recording in, in person, maybe. You just oh, your, get poor showered. your poor microphone gets showered oh, the whole time. It's a new microphone every time. They just malfunction. You, you know. People always say, oh, Ben. Spit? Yeah, they say, oh, Ben, why don't you do long form podcasts? I'm like, well, I, I spit so much when I speak that the microphones break before I can do a long form one. My younger son, um, who you met just a few minutes ago, um, is almost two, but still wears one of those drool bibs because he has been a very big drooler. He has stuffed nose or something that means he's constantly like a mouth breather and my husband often says that if his drool was a source of energy he could power a city so maybe you spit and donnie's drool it could happen product idea number one i'll make this make a note of this one one. one. (laughs) how many product ideas can we come up with (laughs) Um, um but we actually want to talk about product agility here. Yes. Yeah. So that was well, topics very- related to product agility. I'm going to just spitball here for a second. Um, I think what Ben and I just did was incredibly agile. And one of the things I have often recommended product people and product teams to do is to take an improv class. Because what Ben and I just did was improvisation not planned. There was no script in case any of you thought there might have been. Um, One would hope we were funnier. (laughs) I don't think there is any fear of that. (laughs) But um, part of improvisation is working with what you're given from somebody else. And that, to a certain degree, is incredibly agile. With the end in mind, in the case of improv, you want somebody to laugh. you have to roll with the punches and see what someone else has said. And in the tech world, that may be a stakeholder or a competitor releases something. And you have to adjust what your plan is to get to that end result and be agile. And improvisational techniques can be very, very helpful when learning to work with each other, learning to what's called yes and each other so that people Mm -hmm. don't get as defensive or clam up because you really want to leverage all the members of your team and their special knowledge, et cetera. And so um, it's just my pitch for taking an improv class as an individual or a group. I like it. Well, I don't like improv. It scares the shit out of me. Why does it scare you? Because I am fine like this, right? Because... It takes me a while to to trust people and relax and get into it, unless there's like a contextual frame a little bit, right? So, for example, in case anyone was wondering, me and Tammy have spent probably an maybe in total like an hour before this over the course of two conversations, like just getting to know each other a little bit. And I feel like, you know, we've had the measure of each other and conversations just kind of evolve, don't they? You push each other a bit further and one person swears, and then the other person swears, or one person swears and says they're offended because you swore. And then we just goes on and on, and then kids arrive, you know, and then and pets arrive, and then before you know it, you know, you're arranging conferences and things just roll on. But you kind of get a, you get a feel for someone, and I'm fine doing it that way, but in a room where I haven't kind of built that, you know, then I think I just find it a little bit scary, I suppose. But I think maybe when it's I'm- this... Go on. I don't know, improv is definitely scary. And what the reason why I asked is because you nailed it on the head as to what makes teams more successful or not. And agile teams are more successful when they can trust one another. 
One product can trust yeah. engineering, and engineers can trust one another, and engineers can trust product and design to give them what they need. And uh, it's really so much of success in the business world is trust. And so to me, improv sometimes can be a, a speed track to realizing we're all human and can trust each other quit more quickly. But if you don't trust each other, you can't do things like that. And so it often can surface where there is lack of trust and lack of ability to be vulnerable, which we all need to be. So, mm. yeah. so scary for good reason. What, what is it then? If we think of kind of agile teams, like creating a product at the time of memoriam, right? Generally, those products have been software products. We're not talking about uh, often just purely physical. There's an element of tech involved in what we're kind of talking here. So we've got those teams who are doing that creation, the the coding, testing, deployment, et cetera. And then you've got the more product people on the other side who are looking at vision and strategy and setting some of a di- setting some direction, articulating the why, uh, bending, adapting, creating hypotheses, getting data from maybe what, hopefully what's going on with the real users and then feeding that back in and you know, hoping uh, all that when it's working brilliantly, you've got a lovely, nimble, adaptable product. But a lot of the time it doesn't happen like that, right? Because it seems to me that there is big trust issues and maybe even some Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not religious issues, but some issues around the dogmatism, okay. particularly from the agile world. Yeah. Dogmatism. Yeah. So the agile world was saying, well, we, 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 ha- we, we hate sequential stuff. Nothing can be sequential. We need to be involved. In it, but no, but sometimes from the product aspect, there isn't, there's a sequence of things you want to go through because you want to increase the probability that your bet's going to pay off. So we can't just give you this really vague thing. And so there's this tension and then there's kind of, then we don't get very far. So I'm wondering, yeah. what is it? What, what, what can we do to build that trust between these different factions or, or different question? You know, what is it that are we observing when the agile, t- the agile teams, the people who are creating the products and the people then kind of send the direction for it, don't quite get along? So one of the core beliefs I have is that transparency builds trust. Transparency builds trust. And that means that both sides of the conversation need to be sharing information about their expertise. So if a product person is only telling the engineers what to do and not why, where it's aligned to business goals, where it's aligned to customer needs, where where the idea came from, what happened in some customer interviews where they got some feedback on the UX design, right? If they just say, hey, we need to change this or hey, we need to add that. It doesn't help the engineers build trust that the product manager is coming from a place of knowledge. So you have to explain more of the why. In the same respect, an engineer needs to be transparent with the product team as to why something can or cannot be done, how something can be done in a more easy way or a less easy way, why they're choosing to do a particular kind of infrastructure setup or otherwise, and where there are trade-offs in the decisions they're making. Because when you can have that more transparent and open lines of conversation, you can together be headed towards a destination that you've chosen. Whereas if things become more, one team throws something over to the fence, uh, over the fence to the other team, and there isn't a lot of transparency about why decisions are being made, you don't end up with the best ideas, you don't end up with the best code, and you don't end up with the best product. And the more we can be transparent and honest as to why we want to do something a particular way, the more teams can bond and actually come up with more elegant solutions towards reaching the end goal. Mm. It's really funny. I was making some notes as you were talking there, and there was something that you said, which wasn't then in how you summarized it yourself. 
but it really kind of hit me somewhere in my head or my heart somewhere somewhere around there because I mean, like the starting with why thing is like we say that everyone bloody says it i got to meet like, simon Sin- uh, how was that it was fantastic i was at did a bar mitzvah with, did he start with why sure like why know. are you talking to me is that how he started <laughs> I was at a bar mitzvah and I turned to the brother of the bar mitzvah girl and I was like, is that Simon Sinek? And he turned to me and said, no, 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 it's just a lookalike. And I was like, really? Because it really looks like him. And he said, no, it's Simon Sinek. He's part of like the family friend group. And I said, fantastic. And so I walked up to him later and I was like, I know that you keep seeing me staring at you and I need you to know I'm just a really big fan. And I'm <laughs> probably in 50% of the talks I give include a slide about starting with why. And he said, well, tell me more about you. Like, who are you? Why would you be talking? And why? <laughs> it was super lovely. Yeah, why? Super lovely. But I totally fan girl that. Like, I don't fangirl out for a lot of things, but Simon Sinek, I totally fangirled out. That's kind of crazy that you end up at a bar mitzvah. Like, what are the chances? What was weirder is I texted my best friend and she said, oh, my friend Joy dated him back in the day. No way. It all comes out in the end, doesn't it, Tammy? It all comes out in the end. Six Um, degrees of Simon Sinek. Screw Kevin Bacon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I say so yeah it's the, anyway so starting with why so absolutely absolutely and I, I like the book I think he does some good stuff but I feel like he's just becoming like motherhood and apple pie statements now you know like it's just one of those things where of course you're going to start with why and everyone says it and people bloody I mean, say I it more people started with why. yeah but they I don't know but I always when people say we're going to start with why and then all they do is talk about what Right or or how and or like, how. So there's a yeah it's like oh we're going to release an MVP when oh two but two years time okay Are you going to get anything up before that nope okay what are you doing why what 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 are you waiting two years for boss said so so that's what we're doing okay do you think about pushing back on that and saying maybe we could test this a little bit earlier in some way nope but we're starting yeah it's okay anyway but you said. It's important for product people in product roles to come to be to effectively show that they're coming from a place of knowledge and not just telling people what to do. And I think yeah. for me that really stuck with me because that is something that I don't I don't hear people say, but it stuck with me because I think that helps build the respect. And I've always said that if you're going to be engaging with other humans, the quicker you can earn trust and respect, the quicker you've got a firm foundation to to do some things which are kind of push to challenge each other or to come up with some crazy ideas or to be brutally honest with someone. But if you don't have that trust and respect and that mutual trust and respect, it's very difficult. And I just thought that coming, you know, the product, well, for both sides of this equation, you know, the the, the product people and the agile people, right, to come together to achieve, you know, some semblance of real product agility, there has to be a, a mutual trust and respect on both sides because, to your point, the product people, they can't just come and say, we've done, you know, go and do this. It's a case of saying, well, this is user research we've done and this is why. And maybe next time if you want to come along, then please, that'd be fantastic if you're interested. Just didn't think you'd be interested. Yeah. But then for the then for the teams to be able to turn around and say, you know, and this is kind of a jumping off point, at least in my mind, is that when the teams are then turning around and able to push back and say, you're putting lots of pressure on us to go fast. And we totally understand where you're coming from. However, us going fast and being really efficient doesn't mean we're going to be that effective right now. And here are the reasons yeah. why. So can we come up with a balance between the two? And you can't do that pushback unless there's trust and respect. And you push back, and unless it's mutual, this is going to fall on deaf ears and it's going to put more pressure on you. And guess what? When it's released and you're you're wondering, why is this costing so much money to run? Oh, because there's loads of defects and there's loads of support tickets and it costs a lot to change. Well, it's because we didn't have that trust and respect built in. Yeah. And I, I've got so many fantastic conversations where engineers have taught me things. I remember when I was at Pivotal Labs, I had we were very big on XP type of agile and thus very small stories, deliverable software. And I mean, it's what Pivotal Labs is known for. And I had written very, very small stories about a particular table. And I said, 
let's build out this table. Like the user value is that they can see the information on the table. Then later we can create filters and sort functionality, et cetera, right? Those are incremental valuable things. And the engineer said, why aren't we just doing it all together? And I said, well, like we should be doing this incrementally. And he took me aside and he said, let me show you something. And I said, okay, let me see, right? Because I'm open to learning. I'm excited to learn. And he said, there's this Ruby gem, which is a table type. And we just say it's this type and it comes with filter and sort and search by default. And we just put in the gem and we're done. And I said, fantastic, let's use that. Right? And then every table we built was like that. But imagine how much time could have been wasted in doing something quote unquote by the book because we didn't have a collaborative conversation. I think that a lot of agility in companies is missing so many of the important points when it comes to a user story is a placeholder sorry a user story is a placeholder for conversation. Mm. And the role of a product manager is to build confidence and trust, one from the engineers but also from all the stakeholders. I work as an executive coach with product leaders. And one of the common things I have to explain to them is that when they're giving a presentation to sales leadership or the service leadership or the board or the executive team, their goal is not to inform. Their goal is to build trust and respect and confidence that they as a leader have their handle on what the market needs have their handle on what the customer needs, have the handle, have their handle on what the business goals are, and they have a good idea as to how to align and come up with a solution that is sellable, that is marketable, that is something customers need and will buy, that will help advance towards the mission and vision of the company. And that is their goal. Not to show a roadmap so that everyone knows what's going to happen every quarter, but to show. I know what this business needs to move forward. I'm also willing to be agile as we learn things change because I'm always interested in what's going to serve our customers and our business best. And that's what you want to build trust and confidence in. Not that the roadmap you provide is going to be perfect and everything's going to be delivered in the quarter or the week you say, but instead that they can entrust you with delegating to the engineering team what should be built and that what will be built will be something that is marketable and adds value to the business and solves problems for the customers. And that's a really big shift for a lot of people. How much of the role of a product manager, product owner, do you think is then building relationships? Um, in reality, it's probably in the like 75% realm. But um, I actually was just messaging with this individual. So there is a gentleman whose name is Justin Chang. He's currently over at uh, Clear as their chief product officer. And Justin used to be at ClassPass, which I believe is international, but pretty much it's an app that allows for you to be a member of many yoga studios instead of just one. Uh, it's the best way to explain mm -hmm. it. And um, Justin and I met probably a decade ago at this point. And he said something that I repeat to a lot of people, which is that product management is two words for good reason. There is the product portion, which is making the right strategic decisions about what will make your product better. And there is the management portion, which is bringing everyone else along. Whether that's stakeholders, engineers, designers, product marketers, everyone in between, the executive team, it's bringing everyone else along. And you can't bring everyone else along unless you have an established relationship with them. And unless you have built trust and confidence in the interactions you've had. And of course, and when you get bigger, that gets harder. 100%. And so part of um, what is organizational design or team topography design, whatever you want to call it, agile team design, empowered team design, is figuring out 
what's the right number of people and how do you get them to build this trust amongst themselves so they can make better decisions and faster decisions, more agile decisions without circling again and again and again, because there isn't enough trust. Hmm. And you mentioned them working with the... Sorry, Tammy. I just said at larger scale, that's harder. Yeah. And you mentioned building trust, confidence with the higher ups that you've got something which is marketable, saleable, scalable. Users are going to love it. And I think the techniques for kind of building the confidence up until you're seeing real data from the actual usage, like that's a that's a story you're going to be telling with the higher ups and you and and you'll get there. I mean, so that's a technique with with the higher ups. I mean, so from the people that you you coach and from your own experience, and what are the techniques that the product managers can use with people who aren't the higher ups if they have to build trust and respect? You know, and and build confidence with other groups. Like, what, what, what are the what are the tips for people? I suppose. So I like to emphasize the right amount of information. So mm-hmm. you don't want to give too much information, but you also don't want to give too little. So too little is go do this. Too much is here's all of the data about why we've chosen this. Blah 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 blah. Here's this study. Here's that study. Here's our mock-ups too much, right? Because that person doesn't do that job. They just want to hear the summary level. And so providing more of a summary level and then allowing someone to do what I call choose their own adventure, which is if they want to do a deeper dive into something, let them ask, let them ask you a question. Let them poke Mm -hmm. holes in why they aren't currently trusting your decision and then provide them the data, which you've obviously done your homework to do because they've asked for it. Don't overwhelm them with too much. Wait for them to pull out information Mm -hmm. and learn through that process what is it that's of value to them. So each constituency you work with has different things that they need that will help them build that trust and confidence. And if you give everything, you'll never know what it was you said that helped that particular group of people. But if Mm -hmm. you give a summarized bit of information, you'll learn this particular group always wants to know what market research we did. This particular group always wants to know what the discussion was with the lead engineer about timing of it or risks around it, et cetera. And when you can start learning that through, to a certain degree, feedback loops, You'll be able to even get ahead of that. And when you give your summarized information to a particular group, you can provide that additional layer. Mm. A lot of people forget that there is an appendix option, which can provide a lot of value. An appendix? Appendix with an X at the end. This one you put out. (laughs) That was a throwback to our joke about Grand Prix um, no. for the people who weren't there for that joke. Um, but a, an appendix is a way of showing I did my homework, but I also don't want to bore you with the details. I'm going to give you the information you need to help support this decision so I can bring you along. Hmm. Do you know I think is just, yeah, I- I know it's reassuring, but it's also kind of, I suppose, frustrating, right? Is that the agile world, a lot of it's built upon the idea of plan, do, check, act, like empirical process control. Right? And, and yeah, it's kind of like, there's been a lot, of, a lot of talk about over the years. It's been lost, it's been found, and it's kind of maybe lost again. But it's, it's that kind of, it's what we do, right? When we're figuring something out, we make a little plan in our head, right? We do some stuff and we see what happened and we'll do, okay, change it next time. And we just go on that little loop. And when you said earlier about, yeah, for product roles is about coming from a place of knowledge helps you build that trust and respect. And then actually what you're saying here is it's building that knowledge. It isn't just about you being an SME in the product, which I think is something that you, you have to be an SME in the market, which I think you have to be. And an SME in the people you're talking to. Got, in the people, in the people. And so when you first, and so 
like when people then, if we run a little role, run a little kind of scenario, is that you're a new product person, you're kind of so you're learning your trade a little bit. In the same way that in agile, yeah, it was a kind of a, a a cry against making big, huge specs and doing all this upfront work, and then only to find out you chuck it all out there. You're not sure what's worked, what hasn't. You wait a long time to get feedback. As a as a new product person or someone moving into a new role. It isn't about instantly learning everything before you do something, but it is about kind of learning enough so that you can give a summary and then yeah, let people choose their own adventure, learn the kind of things that they're interested in. So that actually then the third, fourth time you go around that, you know the kind of questions they're going to ask. As a Fred built, you've yeah. built the trust and respect. And then you you don't you know what you have to learn and prime yourself for before you go into those conversations. So again, it's working in small batches, it's getting that feedback, as you said. And it helps them to kind of build that knowledge of the people as well as yeah. the, the product markets, the users, whatever else it may be. If you, can, if you can think of everything to a certain degree as a placeholder for conversation, right? That mm. if you're bringing together people for a meeting, it's because you value their opinions too. If all you wanted to do was inform, you could send a memo. But if you're bringing people together yeah. for a meeting, you're hoping they're going to ask questions about their expertise that helps you make a better decision, that helps you make stronger choices, that's going to give you context you're unaware of. There's what I call the balance of hubris and humility. Product has to have confidence that they can make decisions based on limited data that's going to move something forward. But you also have to be humble that you don't know everything. And that mm-hmm. there are things that you can learn from the other people you work with. And, have you ever read? Okay. I don't see, have you ever read Humble Inquiry by Edgar Schein? No. no. Oh, it's a phenomenal book. Change me as a human. Okay. Um, but it's Some just that point. It's actually, uh, basically, don't uh, prevailing systems have for many years made people successful for being uh, keepers of all knowledge. And hubs for things to come in and out of. But then guess what? World got more complex. We have to have humility and appreciate that we're not, in order to make this shit hot, excuse my language, we need to work together. And there's some things that I don't know, but there's some things that you do know. And actually, I need to accept that I'm not the person who uh, has all the answers and that I am going to need to learn and I am going to need to change and we are going to have to work together regardless of who or where you are in the organization or in any kind of culture if we're working together then we're working together and that's it means us both changing and you know one thing yeah. it doesn't say in there but I believe in collaboration is the it's a process of creating new ideas which couldn't have come from an individual Absolutely. and to do that you know we need you know, to get that level of humility, it comes back down to those relationships. We can't have, yeah, he does also say that if you look at organizations traditionally where it has been these people who are rewarded for having all the knowledge and all the power, but professional relationships kind of work in that respect. So you wouldn't go up to your lawyer or your doctor, like slap them on the back, say, oh, do you want to go for a drink after this? Or do you want to go to the coffee shop? It's a professional relationship. There's certain boundaries around it. Mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe you do, Tammy. But but, 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 we we don't have that type of relationship. Yeah. No. But then that, uh, and that's how it's worked between manager and subordinate, and leader and subordinate, and product and engineering for so long is that it's been this professional relationship where we can't, we don't, we don't generate new ideas, we don't solve problems in the right way. But then what he's saying is actually we go need to go level deeper where we don't need to be friends, but we absolutely need to be open and honest with each other. And I absolutely need to call you out if you are more senior to me, but I don't think what you're doing is uh, the right idea. Or if we need to spend more time on something, or if I feel like we've reached a pseudo agreement, you know, there has to be that openness and those relationships to breed that real uh, openness, transparency, and collaboration. That's what it's in humble inquiries. Actually, we just need to be humble. We need to shut up sometimes and just inquire and really understand the other person, which then loops back around to what you're saying about the summaries and tuners and adventure and et cetera. Yeah. I mean, ask someone their why. Uh, a few years ago, I developed what I called a new feedback formula for managers to be providing feedback to employees, but it could really be used in any sense. Um, and it, the the logo for it is like the anti Oreo cookie, right? <laughs> like nobody likes Oreo cookie feedback. 
there's a concept of the cream filled cookie, which is that like, you're going to give you something positive, but then I'm going to give you the meat of my critique. And then I'm going to give you something positive at the end, like the cookie sandwich. Bad idea. Uh, do, you know, um, do, you, do you know what we call that in the UK? What do you call it? Uh, are your American kids around? Can they hear? No, they cannot. Oh, we call it, we shit call it for sandwich. shit sandwich. Yeah, yeah, the shit sandwich. Right. So it was originally yeah. conceptually something else, but everyone knows it's a shit sandwich. And what studies yeah. have shown is that when you do that too often, people don't even hear the compliment you're giving to begin with. They're just getting prepared defensively for the negative. And so the feedback process that I advocate for is very similar to an agile set uh, setup, which is I observed something. Tell me why you took these actions. Just let someone explain why they did something. Because that shows them that I have the humility that I don't necessarily, I'm not inside their brain. I don't know why they did something. I don't have all the context. And once they can tell me why they did something, I can then provide them additional context that they might not already have had and say, great, I understand why you thought that was the right idea. Let me add to that what was actually going on that you weren't aware of. Now tell me with that additional context what you might have done differently. And if they don't make the conclusion you want, you can say, what do you think about this as an option? (laughs) Because again, (laughs) the option of saying that wouldn't have worked based on this context I know. Hmm. It's interesting when you're in that. Go on. If you as a manager say, I saw you do this. I want you to do it this way next time. This way is better. That's no longer collaborative. That's no longer respectful that the person in the field might have been doing something based on things I'm unaware of. And similarly, uh, like, vice versa to me, that they should be able to ask me, why did you do this thing? What context are we missing that you haven't shared with us? There's an element here of within within certain constraints, allowing people to retain their freedom of choice as to what they do. And I feel there's also an element here of taking a they're taking the systemic viewpoint of saying, do you know what, there is no good and bad really in a system and there is no right or wrong. Everyone's just trying their best. So the more I can learn about the system and the stuff that's going on around it, what's going on for that person, the better a boy I am to help them. I'm giggling because I almost said it's non-binary. And in fact, all things technology are founded on binary. But I know. this really abstracted that part out, right? And the, the humility to say, it's not important that it's perfectly right. It's that it's done, right? Perfect is the enemy of done. Very agile as a concept. Um, and that it's okay if someone does something differently than I would, as long as we end up with the same result we want. And that is a really hard thing for a lot of product people to let go of. This is a hard thing, I think, for a aspiring or like novice coaches to let go of. If you've got expertise or knowledge in the domain and you are coaching somebody, it's really hard to let go of how you think it should be done and let them do it in the way that they feel uh, is right for them. Yeah. It was definitely one of the hardest coaching hurdles I I, 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 have, I had to overcome when I was a product uh, first time around as a product owner in a scrum environment you know I was so anchored on believing that I knew the way that it should be done and get back to your conversation about the tables you know, um, and kind of getting all that stuff for free yeah. just by using the standard kind of type of table that was available was that working on my own and just going in there and just kind of doing all the loads of upfront work, thinking I knew the best way to do it, rather than sitting with a team and saying, right, okay, this is a user. 
His name is Richard. He sits in the other office. If you would like, we can go and see Richard and he can tell you what it is that he's experiencing right now. That would have saved me weeks of my life if I just well, had the humility, you know, to let, to let go of some of that and actually let the teams decide how they want to build the backlog and let me just facilitate the conversation, let them build the relationships. Because what, what value, honestly, I shouldn't have been the product owner. I was uh, what I'd call a, te- a temporary fake product owner. But the okay. real product owner didn't want to take on the actual responsibility. So I knew that whilst I had expertise in a portion of the domain, I didn't have expertise in enough of it. And this guy, Richard, should have taken it on. I don't think Richard's going to be listening to this. So I think we're right. Um, I, I thought I'll send it to him. Um, but no, but so I actually getting out of the way and letting the teams kind of take that freed me up to then figure out, okay, great. So that's going to be happening. And what can I do, which is valuable? Because what I was doing was not valuable. Nope. Giving, attempting to give engineers all the answers is not a valuable use of your time, 100%. <laughs> uh, so there are two things you mentioned that that struck me. One is that too often we don't give enough context about the user. I happen to like personas, but not everyone does. doesn't make a difference. Mm-hmm. Just context. Provide context. From the around what the business is trying to do, around what the customer problems are, around where we are in the journey towards our mission and vision as a product. Give that, invest the time in that before a new initiative gets kicked off. Mm. It is worth the investment. Getting back to the talking about the why instead of just the what or the how. But number two that so many people forget is when questions come up, during the three to six months you might be working on something, bring it back to the why. Don't simply answer the question. Repeat back, what is our goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? What are the metrics we're using to monitor this? What are we, what are we, where are we trying to move the needle? And that will help everyone make the decision together as opposed to the very common protocol I see, which is, Engineer reads user story, engineer begins coding, something is a block for them. They come to the product owner or product manager and they say, I'm not sure what to do. This happened. Product manager, product owner provides, oh, okay, let's change it to this. Solution. As opposed Hmm. to, let's revisit what are we trying to do here? What do we together think is the best option to move forward? And those smaller interactions of collaboration build the foundation towards the larger ones and the larger ability for an engineer to stand up and say, I don't think that's a value. I don't think that's the right path. But if you don't provide them with enough context, they never will. And you won't always get the best ideas. I think what it really reminds me of then is David Marquette. Okay. Good old David Marquette. Turn the ship around. You read that one? Ben, so, I think we might have a, a, first time. the question, did you read that one for me is most often no, because no, I rarely read enough. through an entire book um, or even most of a book, mainly because I'm dyslexic and I don't read books very often. I listen to podcasts. Fair enough. I leave it in short yeah. form. Um, and very often people teach me things. So please teach me about David. Ah, well, I will send you a link to a video as well. Sounds um, perfect. And I've actually, I just as a little, little plug, if you did want to listen, I did a podcast of a guy called Noel Warnell who covered different reading techniques, oh. um, which uh, as a fellow dyslexic person, I found very useful actually, just a oh. different way to, different way to kind of build, build a different healthier relationship with books. Now in the book and in the video, it's a good video. Oh. He says that in order to, give authority where the information is you need to have clarity and competency and uh, building that context the absolute i think builds uh that builds a lot of the clarity but i think what you were saying there is 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 perfect because if you don't if you spoon feed for teams all the time they're never going to develop the competency to be able to make the decisions which will make your life easier yes so by giving and that I'm, context and by changing your way, then you, you help them build their competencies too. And on the flip side. Well, I am 
not sorry for the abrupt ending because the conversation Tammy and I had was deep and long and as a consequence it had to be two parts so I left it on a cliffhanger-ish so that you come back next week and hear the second part now Tammy and I's conversation was unique I think to some of the other conversations I had on the podcast clearly me and Tammy got along very well but that doesn't take away from the fact that there was a, so many golden nuggets there whether it's this idea of multi-tier discovery, which I think is so critical when you're thinking about platforms and not spoken about very often at all, or what makes a platform a success. The problems with user stories and how Tammy, from a product perspective, sees them and how we can make them better, the importance of collaboration. Now, one thing that I'm sure didn't slip your mind there was also that prioritizing what we do and make sure we're focusing on the most valuable tasks is a worthwhile thing for us as humans and professionals and that bleeds through into everything we do so if you can't look around and to the people you're with to your colleagues your peers maybe even sometimes the other people who may be in your organization or life system and see if you're all working towards the same goal then there's always an opportunity for maybe a conversation so anyway without getting all ethereal let's end this one come back next week for the second episode of tammy and until that point, thank you very much for listening. I am Ben Maynard, and this is the Product Agility Podcast.